Let's take a look at some basic applications of more circles for some classic uh, situations. One of them being the uniaxial uh, test or the tension test. Right? So here's a typical specimen, flat bar specimen, right? And it has the strain gauges on it already. And here's that similar specimen that is at the point of failure. Notice then how we've got this necking that's happening right down here, this narrowing. It also happens a little bit in the other dimension as well, but you'll see it significantly uh, right there. So that thing is about ready to go. And here's what one of those then looks like after we pulled it apart. Okay, that's how we, we run that test and do it to get the stress drain behavior. Right, so the basic model here, of course, is that this stress that, uh, that's happening in this, this, here's the big picture and the stress down at the micro level, that sigma just equals the P over A. So let's see how that works from then creating more circle, right? First step, of course, is let's just create our axes that go with our situation. And remember that the horizontal axis is gonna be your normal stress action, axis. And so we'll plot tension to the right, compression to the left and then we'll have our shear stresses on the other axis. We have counterclockwise shear stresses on the bottom and clockwise up at the top. I remember how to do this because CW has fewer letters than counterclockwise, so therefore it's like helium, it rises to the top. The other one is heavier, so it goes down to the bottom. That's how I remember that. All right, so set up the axes first. And then the next thing to do is you got to get two points, two points that are on orthogonal or 90 degree planes. Usually take that as the X plane and the, the Y plane. So there's your point A. And we want the normal stress and the shear stress on that plane. The normal stress would be our sigma is in tension and it would be equal to P over A here. And there's no shear stress on that plane. So we have zero for the second coordinate. For point B, well, we've got no stresses from a normal or a shear stress uh, situation. So zero and zero would be the two coordinate points for that one. And then we just plot those two, right? So of course, B is at the origin, boom, there you go. And then A is out here at sigma equal P over A and zero. So there's your point A. And again, that value is, in this case, just sigma equal P over A, right? now. The straight line that goes between A and B is your diameter for your circle. And of course, like any diameter, the midpoint of it is going to be your radius or your origin. It'll give you the radius and it also locates the origin of your circle. That's really the average of these two normal stresses that gives us, and that would be sigma over two would be where that's located. And because that turns out to be horizontal, the circle has to go through all that. That's actually also the radius that tells us that where our high points and bottom points are on our circle, and also all the other points too. There's a nice little arc that's created there, nice circular arc. And of course, you're not gonna freehand that. You're going to go buy yourself a circle template. There you go, just like that would be a good one to have. You can get it at all kinds of different places, including online if you really want to, but you can find them locally as well. Right, so there's your circle. Now there's a whole lot of interesting things going on here. One note that in this case, the circle is entirely on the right half of the diagram. That means, because remember the circle plots every single possible combination of normal stress and shear, split, shear stress on any oriented plane all the way throughout the system. So since the circle is entirely over on the tension side, that means nowhere in this particular system here do you see any compressive stresses. That's one important thing to note. The other is to note where the maximum shear stress is located, which is at a more circle. Well, we go 90 degrees over to that maximum value, right? 90 degrees in more circle is 45 in real life. So that means the maximum shear stress is happening at 45 degrees in real life. That's incredibly interesting because we go back to these two pieces, two halves of our tension test, right? And we were pulling, well, maybe you like it better this way, pulling, 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 and eventually they separated. Now, take a really close look. I'm gonna get a 
out of the way, take a really close look at those failure surfaces, right? Not this little arc that's the necky, but rather that failure surface itself. Notice how jagged it is, right? That's kind of interesting too, right? It's hard to get that to be perfectly focused, but you can kind of get the idea. Notice it's not str really straight across. There is a little nature here, right? That is what we call the cup and cone failure. So when this thing failed and pulled apart, what you're gonna see at that failure location, we don't care about what's going on out here in the ends. We care about what's happening right here. And whether it's circular or flat, what you're gonna see are little regions that are 45 degrees. And the two fit together, the two halves will fit together. They're, they're sometimes hard to put back to, together, but but they're, they're gonna fit together and you're gonna see these little 45 degree things. What happens ironically is in these tension tests, these metals that are ductile, is that they're actually weak and shear. That they'll end up, you know, at low loads, right? So sigma equal P over A, low loads, that circle is way down in here. And as we gradually load this up, that circle gets larger and larger and larger until the point where you actually initiate failure that's slipping actually shear planes on that 45 degrees. And then as that starts to finally fail, then you get this straight across sort of brittle tensile stress failure or really tensile strain type failure that happens that finally ruptures the whole thing. But the ductile behavior part is actually because of shear planes where the atoms can slide past each other much more easily than actually breaking the bond down at that atomic level. And this is how we begin to do detailed forensic analysis. There's the large scale structural forensic detail analysis, and then there's the micro level and the atomic level that the material scientist and materials engineer will help us with. And these are the kinds of things that they begin to look, on, look at. They look at these, these failure surfaces and they, can, they know what the material is supposed to be, but they can then begin to reverse engineer what really happened here? And it all goes back to understanding these basic stress mechanics of what's going on, where the maximum stresses are at, what planes those are, are at, et cetera, et cetera, right? So really fascinating detailed kinds of stuff. Now let's, let's uh, back up just a little bit from just a basic uh, mathematical procedure thing, right? Simple state of stress that we've got here, uniaxial uh, tension, right? Notice that means that more circle, no matter what the magnitude of sigma is, more circle needs to be tangent to this vertical axis that represents the shear stresses. Nowhere in that case would we have then a compressive stresses anywhere. Now, if you do this in the reverse and squeeze this, this whole thing will rotate about this vertical axis, and now more circle will be tangent to on the other side of that, that whole thing. 